was the ability to connect with anyone around the world. It's very different from how a lot of us grew up, right? It's, I mean, when I grew up, you know, still long distance calls were prohibitively expensive to communicate with anyone outside you know, my town or city. You know, now we have access to everyone around the world. So and have, they have a lot of it coming as well. So I'm always very sensitive on this because you know, it always feels very tough. You know, whatever challenges you're dealing with feel very, you know, they're, they're very personal, they, you feel that very acutely, and then other people's challenges, it's easy to abstract away. So I, I, I always think it's, you, you need to be careful about, um, about, about kind of judging the position that you're in compared to others. Um, but objectively, I do think that, uh, you know, Silicon Valley or, or the tech industry and, and our company in particular are just at the center of a lot of social issues. And, you know, what, what I think, I think we have a responsibility to step up and make progress on a lot of these things. There are, there are real questions that the internet raises, um, you know, around the, the democratic process and the integrity there, around free expression versus um, safety, around privacy and, and competition and well-being and all these things. And I, I just, I mean, we need to get these right, right? And, and I think a lot of this, it's not that any one company can get it right by themselves. I think we need it needs to be a broader approach, but it's going to require government as well. Um, but certainly, I, I feel like we have a big responsibility in this. So I, um, you know, I, I just want to make sure that we do the best that we can on this stuff, and we just take it all super seriously. It weighs on us a lot. What are the principles you live by as a founder, entrepreneur, and of those principles, which ones do you wish you would have adopted? Much earlier. Hmm. So there's a bunch of rules or heuristics that have developed around hiring, for example, that um, that I think have been helpful. I'm not sure if that's the type of thing they're asking about, but it's. Yeah, I mean, the hardest thing for me early on was because you know, I, I just started off as I, I was. I was an engineer, or you know, I wasn't even really an engineer. I was a student, right? It's, I, I thought I was going to be an engineer when I graduated. And you know, when you're, when you're building something yourself, you, you kind of have all the meanings in your head, right? It's like you don't need to articulate the principles so clearly. It's like you kind of can make all the trade-offs on on everything from architecture to product to marketing to you know, just all these things, and you're, you're kind of just you have the context to trade this off. And I think it's really easy when you, when you start building something to, um, to underestimate how much context you need to put out there and how clear you need to be about what you're trying to do. So, you know, most of my mistakes early on in building the company were about not being clear enough internally about what we were trying to do. And there's this very famous you know, episode where, where, like, in 2006, a couple years into building the company, um, Yahoo tried to buy us. And it was a, they, they offered a ton of money, and a lot of the people who, who I'd hired at the point, they were kind of experienced technology executives, and this was like all of their startup dream come true, right? They, they joined, and then you know, within you know, a year or a few months, like the, the, the company had the opportunity to exit for this large amount of money. And you know, I really failed through that period to communicate what we were trying to do and what we what we stood for, and in the absence of that, then of course it was a rational thing for people to think that this was like a good outcome for us to have. Um, and that was a really difficult period. That was actually, you know, the last, the last few years have been challenging because there, there are so many social issues that we're at the center of the need to help resolve, but that was actually the hardest period. For me Early on, it was harder than. Yeah, that, 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 that piece in 2006. And the, the reason, I mean, because literally, our, I mean, our, the team fell apart, right? I mean, it was, you know, it's, I, I turned down this offer to sell the company. Um, the, the management team there were a bunch of, of, of pretty experienced folks, um, but who hadn't spent a lot of time working at Facebook, weren't, weren't that steeped in, in what we were trying to do. Um, you know, the, the group basically fell apart. Within, within, I think it was 18 months after that, every single other person on the management team either quit or it was just so dysfunctional that I had to fire them. And, and most of them quit. And that was really challenging. I, I think I was like 22 at the time. 
So again, it's like I was, I just, I, I hadn't learned, you know, most of the lessons that I have learned to this point on, on managing. Um, but you know, I kind of feel like when you have an internal team cohesion and you have a team that believes in something, you can get a lot of things done and you can handle a lot of adversity. But when you break that, when that starts to break down, um, it becomes very hard to get things done. And you know, even, so through the other big challenges that we've had to navigate over time, um, you know, not just the last couple of years, but um, you know, after we went public, where we had a big business model challenge, we were transitioning from a, a desktop and web-based business to mobile. Um, our, our app wasn't in, in the space that I wanted it to be. We didn't have ads in Newsfeed yet, so we weren't sure if that was going to work. Um, we went public, and our market cap got cut in half in like within the first year. And, and people doubted whether we were going to be able to make this transition to mobile. And, you know, empirically, that's not a crazy thing to doubt because a lot of technology companies basically die or really lose their way during these big technology shifts, right? So of which going from web to mobile was certainly one. Um, but you know, through that period, we were able to maintain very good team cohesion internally. Everyone had a strong sense of mission. They knew what we were there to do. Um, they believed in the product. Um, they cared about connecting people and bringing the services to more people around the world. Um, so actually, it, it didn't end up being that that challenging of a, of a period in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, not that many people quit. Uh, people saw through the, the, the challenge that we needed to go that we needed to go do, and we came out of that well. Um, but the internal team cohesion thing is a really big deal. I think that, and that's probably applicable to all the different companies that you're all working on, and I'm sure you all have your own versions of these, these stories, but um, you know, if you can be clear about the principles and make sure that the, the team is, is, is aligned on that, you can perform miracles, and without that, it's just everything becomes so painful. Who are your mentors? Who do you call for advice? Um, well, there are, I think that it, it's different people for different things. I've become more religious. Really? Yeah. Um, well, there's a, I mean, that's not really a mentorship thing, but it's, um, but I do think that there's a scale. I don't know. I, the last few years have been really humbling for me. Right? I mean, I, I, I thought I, like, knew a lot about how to build something, and, I don't know, I think that there's just a comfort in knowing and having confidence that there are things that are bigger than you. And I mean to me that's what like giving people a mission is when, when you're when you're building a company. Right? And, so, and that's like why why talking about principles and, and, and laying that out so clearly is so important. Um, I mean it's also why I, mean, I have so much faith in democracy overall, that's why I care so much about giving people a voice. Right? So, it's you know I, I I don't know, I think at some point in order to move forward, given how complex modern society is and all the challenges that we face, you have to believe in things that are bigger than yourself, no matter what form that takes. And um, so I mean, I, I, I mean, I, personally, I grew up, I'm Jewish, and you know, I, I mean, so I grew up with that, and that culture has been really important to me, but I mean, but certainly, I think it's a combination of the challenges that we've been through as a company, and um, and having kids, right? So now I, I'm gonna have two girls, four and two. <laughs> yeah, anyhow, yeah, probably that, that's kind of a different answer than you were probably expecting. Maybe not even an answer to the question, but still sort of relevant. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. You're religious. I love it. <laughs> what can you teach us about creating mission and values for a company? You've talked a lot about that already, but. Um, I mean, how do you actually create a mission? How do you actually create values for a company that means something? Well, I don't know if you create them. So, so early on, someone gave me this advice uh, that I, I, I we were talking about like um, values early on. And I was like, oh, I think it's kind of corporate to write down values. I was really wrong about that. Um, you really want to be clear about what you stand for. Um, but um, I don't know, maybe it's both corporate and you want to be clear about what you stand for. But it's, and so someone gave me this advice, which was, you have values, so you better just write down what they are. Because if you write down, like it's, I mean, I think companies write down sometimes what they want their values to be, 
and then it's dissonant with what you actually believe and how you actually operate. And part of building a company is trying to communicate to a group of people, both internally and outside the company, what, um, you know, how you're going to operate. So I kind of think what you need to do is, is just write down the encode and, and, and try to encode that and capture that. And, and you, you, need to, you need to be honest about it, right? And it's, it, it's not like, it shouldn't be, you know, some crap about how you wish you were some platitudes. It should actually be how you operate. And I, I also, I guess in writing down values, I've always thought that um, there was this tendency to just write down platitudes, right? Stuff that, that no one really disagrees with, right? Be honest. Okay, yeah, obviously you should be honest, right? Everyone should be honest. If you're not going to be honest, don't work at our company and leave. But that's not really a trade-off, right? It's, you're, not like, you're not like giving something up to be honest. So that's not, I, I think that that's kind of hard to, to kind of have. I mean, that, that, that should be a given, right? Not one of the, the things that, that kind of defines the company is having a different culture. Um, so, yeah, I think you want, you want values that you legitimately disagree with. So inside our company, um, you know, our values are things like move fast and be open. Uh, you know, ironically, I mean, I'm, I'm up here talking about how you know, the, the external communication of the company hasn't been good over time. I think that that's true. But I think the internal communication since that Yahoo episode that I was talking about is actually been a strength of, of kind of how we built up the, the company. And that's because at every step along the way, we've erred on the side of being more open internally. Um, you know, we always, uh, and I do a Q&A with, with all employees every week, um, where not only will I answer pretty much any question that anyone has, but we go out of our way to get the hardest questions. We, we built up new processes over time as the company has scaled, so that way, um, you know, we, people can now vote on the top questions that they want to get answered. People can submit questions anonymously, and then, you know, at, at the top of the Q&A, I'll take the top five voted questions to make sure that I'm answering the hardest thing. So it's all these things kind of build up this culture inside the company where you're you're just really open um, about what's going on. You answer the questions honestly, and that sets a tone. Um, and of course, it just makes information available to people broadly if they can ask me anything. And it makes it so I, as the CEO, can know what people are, are honestly wondering about around the company, which is a valuable signal for me in running the company. Now, that's not the only way to run a company. I think you can you can uh, legitimately disagree with that. Right, and, and, I mean, like Apple, for example, is on the complete opposite side of the spectrum, and they're obviously extremely successful too. Right, so so being open, I think, is something that one can disagree with, but is how we operate. It's authentic to us, and therefore, I think it's a good articulation of a value. It's been valuable to write that down because that way, as we've scaled, we've been able to encode and build up more processes and tools um, to make sure that we can live up to that value at scale. So we've been talking a lot about, at this conference over the past two days, mental health. And just the challenges of, of the loneliness of building a company, of being an entrepreneur, the loneliness of, be, loneliness of being a founder, what it takes, the fact that when you're building it, nobody cares what you're doing. You had a little bit different experience, a lot of people cared. But most people, um, you know, as they're growing a company at the very beginning, you know what I mean, it's very lonely. And it leads to mental health issues. And, the, and he, there's also criticism that social media leads to mental health issues. How do you stay grounded? I, don't know, I think a lot of this on the stuff that, well, personally, and I'll talk about the social media. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, a minute. Um, you know, for me, it's, I, I think the answer to this is probably the answer. You know, I can answer your mentorship question now. But, it's, um, but I think the, the answer. By the way, I expected Bill Gates, not God. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I was not saying that God is a mentor. That would be like, the opposite of what I was trying to, to get across. Um, and Bill Gates has been, especially on the philanthropy side. He's, um, um, he's, he's a huge role model, both in how he built the company and uh, as a model for me personally in terms of uh, once you've built something that is successful, what are you supposed to do next? Um, and one of the main lessons that he taught me is you should start early, right? Because philanthropy, just like any other skill that you want to build up, takes practice. and. You know, if, if this is something that I want to dedicate more of my time to in 10, 15 years, then you know, we better start now and get practice on how that works. But no, I mean, I think um, you know, part of staying grounded is like, you know, you, you need, I think you need to understand the context that you operate in. And um, you know, work is important, and you know, a lot of you are doing really important things, and, and I, I hope that the stuff that we're doing has a positive impact and, and has an important impact on people. Um, but, but at the end of the day, you know, we're all people, 
and you know you, you need you know, your family and your friends and uh, communities around you of, of things that are interesting to you that are not just work and um, you know, I think we all need to feel like we're parts of things that are bigger than ourselves and I, I just think that that's important and, and um, you know, so my family and friends have been an incredibly important part of how I've stayed grounded um, but yeah, and I, and I do just think, you know, just managing your time well, it's, it's you know, it's, I mean, you're, you're all doing jobs where the reactive incoming in anything that any one of us is doing could take all of our day. And I, I think making sure that you just have the discipline to say, no, look, I, I, I'm going to deal with reactive stuff for this amount, but I need to spend a bunch of my time just on stuff that's going to push the ball forward, and, um, and then, at some point you have to go home and yeah, stuff comes up and you don't always, you know, I, mean, I try to put my girls to bed every night and you know, some nights I don't get to, but generally, like, I, I'm, you know, you, you want to try to draw some boundaries so you can do that. Um, that's, that's important to me. Um, all right, so. So, 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 so the social media side of this, uh, maybe a little more, a little more concrete. But um, we've studied this a lot, I mean, because, because obviously I, I want our products to, to be good for people, right? And the, the research on this is that, like anything, you know, not all internet use or social media use is the same. If you're using products to stay connected with people and you're having meaningful interactions, um, then that is associated with a lot of positive aspects of well-being. Right? You, you feel more connected, you feel happier, you feel less lonely over time. That's correlated with you know, feeling healthier, better outcomes there. But if, if what you're doing is you know, you're using the internet or, um, you know, or, or even if you're just using our products to um, you know, just scroll through content passively and uh, you know, it's, it's just have, have fun but you know, not, not actually interact with people, and some of that's bad. It just isn't associated with the same positive aspects of well-being that connecting with people is. So I just think what, what our company is about is you know, giving people a voice, helping people connect. It's, it's that duality of those two things um, together. And on the connection side, I, I just always want to make sure that that stays front and center. So you know, a couple years ago, we made some really big changes um, in our products that you know, it, one change, it, it, the, the changes were, were designed to make sure that you know, in Facebook and Instagram, um, you know, the content that you're seeing is, is generally going to be about your friends, things that are going to encourage interactions between people that are going to be meaningful. Um, we had one single change that wiped out 50 million hours of viral video watching a day in order to prioritize more content from people's communities. Because, you know, if we showed the viral videos, people would spend more time in the products, but then at the end they would tell us, hey, you know, I'm not necessarily getting from Facebook what I want, right? I, you, know, you guys are, are the, the company that's supposed to help me connect with people, and, you know, there are lots of places I can go to watch videos. I come to you because I want to help connect with people. Um, so, yeah, and we, we, we took down the amount of usage, and, and I think, um, I mean, what was it? It was a couple months later we had, I think it was the biggest stock drop in the history of the stock market. I think we lost, like, $100 billion of market cap in a day um, when we reported our so, but I mean, look, it's, you know, I think we're, we're here to do good things in the world, right? So, I mean, that's, yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to focus on, um, on, on what we think is going to deliver the best experience for people, and, um, and, and I think that that research is also, you know, it, it's, that also has mapped to how I think what my girl's using, uh, my, my daughter's using uh, uh, products, for example, like I'll let them do video chat with, with their families because that's about connecting with people, I think that that's great. But in general, you know, not as much of the you know, just passive content consumption. You seem like a very intentional person, and you know, as you go about, and I'm sure you had good intentions, and you know, and, and all the products you've launched and purchased, and you know, launching Facebook and all these different things. How how do you manage unintentional consequences? Well, I think this has probably been the biggest lesson of the last couple of years or few years is. Um, you have to be more proactive, right? So, you know, I think about what we're doing, you know, either in terms of fighting different kinds of harmful content or things like that, or um, or certain privacy issues. Just because of where we came from, 
as a company, we had a, we, we had a, we used to have a more reactive stance, which, you know, it made sense when, when, I, was, when I was a student in a dorm room, where I'd say, you know, people would post stuff, and, you know, back then we didn't have a business that could support having tens of thousands of people on a safety team, and the AI technology hadn't evolved to the point where, where you could meaningfully you know, write a machine learning algorithm that, um, that could identify some of the bad stuff. But at some point along the way, that changed. Right, where, where now it is possible for us to make those investments. And the AI technology, while it's not perfect yet, and it still requires a lot of investment to get to where we want it to be, um, you know, now it, it is better to the point where we can do a lot more proactively. So, as one example, I was talking before about like actually the truly bad types of content that you want to get rid of, like the terrorist propaganda for recruiting people. Um, you know, we built an AI system. Um, along with this counterterrorism team uh, that we have in the company, that now uh, we, we are able to flag and identify and take down. Um, you know, it's ninety-nine percent of the terrorist content that we take down. Um, our systems get before anyone sees it on the service. So it's like someone posts it, down. Okay, so. So I kind of feel like once you have the ability to do stuff like that, you also have the responsibility to do that. And I mean, actually, frankly, we were a little late to that. It, it would have been possible to do this stuff in 2012 when we went public, right around that time. I mean, again, it's like our whole budget on this stuff today is greater than our whole revenue was there. So you know, we couldn't have done back then what we're doing now. And the AI was not ready yet. But you know, it's, it, I think a lot of this stuff we really started ramping up very seriously um, in 2016, 2017, and. I think maybe it should have been possible starting in 2015 to get ahead of it, and I mean, you know, this is important stuff, so I wish we'd started a couple of years earlier, yeah. So I think that that's the big lesson. Same thing on the privacy side with developers um, and, and some of the issues that we had, like, and this, is, this is the lesson from Cambridge Analytica, right? So you had a developer who people gave access to the data, and then the, the developer um, turned around and sold the data. It was against our policies. But you know, rather than um, waiting for someone to report that, we should have you know, had systems that can proactively uh, go and, and, um, and identify you know, more suspicious behavior. And now we've built up a lot more of that stuff. But you know, for the next set of issues that are going to come in the future, we're going to judge ourselves by, you know, it's, you obviously can't identify everything in advance. But are, are we thinking through what the unintended consequences might be and being more proactive about finding those issues? I do just think we have a responsibility to do that. We started this conversation around the idea that Facebook and something that you said that it's, it's more important to be um, understood than liked. What would you have us understand about you, Mark Zuckerberg? I don't know. I think part of... I haven't been great about communicating about the company. I am especially bad about communicating about myself. Um, it's there's an awkwardness to it, right? It's, um, but I think probably the biggest misperception is you know I, I, I hope this comes across, but like I really care about what we're doing, right? It's, I, I mean the, the decisions that we that we that we make when they're when they're controversial, and it's like I didn't get into this because I was trying to build a business or sell a bunch of ads or make money. I happen to think that advertising is a great model so that way you can offer everyone a service for free because if you want to give every single person in the world a voice, then you want people to be able to afford that. But like for me, this was, this was never about, um, a, a, about, about kind of that side of things. And I, I just think there, there are, I mean, some people just assume that every company must only care about that, about making money. And so any, any kind of policy or any decision must only be motivated by that. Um, or I think some people might just be kind of willfully ignoring kind of the obvious approach that we take for stuff in order to, um, to smear us. But I, I do just think in, in, in general, um, you know, this, the principles around empowering individuals, leveling the playing field, giving everyone a voice, not just the powerful people. The powerful people are always going to have a voice. Right? It's, I mean, it's all, always that the people who are criticizing and, and saying that more stuff needs to be censored are never the people who, 
who um, are actually at risk of being censored themselves. But they have their ways of getting stuff out. Um, so I know, I, I kind of just feel like someone needs to stand up for giving everyone a voice, someone needs to stand up for making sure that individual businesses do have the same tools and abilities that, that larger businesses have. Because at the end of the day, I mean, the way that we create an economy and a, a society that's stable is you want broad-based economic success that comes from small businesses everywhere succeeding, not just a, a handful of companies. And, and by the way, that's important for social cohesion too, right? It's like, I mean, how many of the, the small businesses that people build are end up being kind of physically the hubs in their communities that help bring people together in addition to supplying jobs? Right, so that needs to happen. So I, I don't know. That, that's that's like that's me. That, that's what I care about. Yeah. Um.